Happy Friday, Mr. H here with you. How you doing, man? It was a pretty fast week, so let's hope that the uh, weekend just kind of crawls by. Uh, how you guys doing, man? Just another day on this muddy ice ball dominated by the descendants of psychotic apes. <laughs> oh, so I was thinking the other day, I do that sometimes, it hurts my head. Uh, I was thinking about the Civil War. And, you know, most Civil War battles, most of it happened east of the Mississippi, right? And south of the Potomac, a couple things north of that, you know, Gettysburg comes to mind. Um, not very much going on beyond the Mississippi. They call it the Trans-Mississippi. And I was thinking about Civil War actions that happened outside the uh, area of operations. Yeah, we had some really weird stuff happening in some places you wouldn't really expect to see a Civil War battle. How about the Battle of Picacho Peak? Actually, Picacho Pass. I call it Peak because, well, there it is. It's a peak. <laughs> yep, Arizona. You're looking at that correctly. What has Arizona got to do with the Civil War? Actually, very little. But um, a couple of morons uh, tried to declare a Confederate territory of Arizona in Tucson, and you know, nobody knew what they were actually talking about. And there was a, uh, if you want to call this a battle, about a dozen guys on each side. The California column coming from, you guessed it, California. And something called the uh, Confederate Army, if you want to call it that, in Arizona, which was basically uh, a lot of uh, Mexican landowners and people who worked there. You know, I guess they needed some quick money real fast. Uh, some Confederate soldiers, some people, some Confederate sympathizers. I don't know what they're doing in Arizona. Uh, they had a, a battle over there near Picacho Peak, and, uh, well, Union lost three guys, the Confederacy two, and the Confederates ran off, and uh, anything about a Confederate government in Tucson just kind of disappeared with them. So, the great epic battle, not exactly out of Lord of the Rings, more like a bar fight somewhere in South Philly. Every April the 15th, 1862 and counting, they have a reenactment there. Yeah, every year they do it there. As you can see, more Union guys than Confederate, because no one really knows what a Confederate is in Arizona. And uh, you like that smoke ring, one of the cannons? Yeah, they go there, they have a little fun. Guy feels like drinking afterwards. It's a nice memorial there, Battle of Picacho Pass. I still call it Picacho Peak. Uh, there it is, got the both flags there, a little bugle, a wall. Uh, I'm not sure why a wall is there, but they decided to put it there. Uh, Climbing that peak is not easy. Mrs. H and I have done it. It's a really great view from up there. And, uh, yeah, you do it one time, you say forget it. Went back a second time, it's 117 degrees. We decided just to kind of hang around the memorial. And the later in the day it gets to see the longer the shade is. Yeah, visit that thing in late afternoon. Ever hear about the USS Kearsarge against the Confederate state ship Alabama? Yeah, where did this battle take place? There weren't too many ship-to-ship -ship battles because there wasn't much of a Confederate Navy, but they did happen on occasion. You would think it happened in the Atlantic, off the East Coast somewhere. Nope, this one happened off of Cherbourg. Yep, off the coast of France in the English Channel. 80 years before saving Private Ryan, we got Americans shooting at each other. The USS, United States ship Kearsig, had armored plating put on it, so it's almost a half step away from being uh, ironclad. And the Confederate state ship, CSS Alabama, was putting shots or bouncing off of the iron, plus a lot of shots went high for some reason. That indicates a novice crew. And it's because the CSS Alabama was a commerce raider, right? They would jump civilian ships and take all the money and all of the stuff and plunder and, you know, sell the ship somewhere else and let the crew go with them. So they weren't used to actually fighting an actual U.S. Navy ship. A U.S. Navy ship that was kind of surprised to see a Confederate warship in the English Channel. I gotta admit, that, that caught me off guard first time I read it. Always wondered what it was like, you know, on a deck of one of these ships during a battle. Yeah, look at that. They're definitely not bored. I'll give them that. Look at the captain. He's like, oh, I should listen to my mother. She said I should become an accountant. It sounds like a really good idea about then, doesn't it? Well, this, this thing is called the Battle of Cherbourg. It was, uh, about nine miles off the coast of France. Uh, sometimes it's Battle of Cher Cherbourg, sometimes sinking of the Alabama because that's what happened. They sunk the ship. Alabama goes down. Uh, they, they rescued most of the crew. Some of the crew got on a British ship that was nearby, and then the British ship took them to London, <laughs> which uh, Captain Winslow of the USS Kearsig was a little bit upset about it, but you can't fire at a British ship because that starts a war at the British Empire. And got enough problems going on. So that ship went down, and at the time, that was international waters. 
three miles was international waters in 1862. And the 1982 Law to Sea Conference, it was confirmed that everyone had 12 miles territorial waters. It might be something that predates that, but they made it official in 82. So now that put that in French territorial waters. But the United States government put a claim on it saying it was international waters at the time. And the French government agreed, and they've had U.S.-French expeditions, you know, diving on the ships because it's really a cool thing to do, huh? wonder if it got in the way of anybody at D-Day. Just wondering. All right, now you think fighting in the English Channel between U.S. and Confederate forces is weird? Get a load of this one. CSS Shenandoah, there's the USS Shenandoah, that's operating in the Atlantic like you would expect it to do. But the CSS Shenandoah was in the, you ready? Pacific. What is a Confederate ship doing in the Pacific? Remember I said Commerce Raider? Right, they're going to try and jump any Union uh, Commerce ship anywhere in the world. And, well, I guess they're reaching out towards the Pacific. Now, when Lee surrendered on April the 9th, 1865... The CSS Shenandoah was uh, in the Carolyn Islands, which is uh, southeast of uh, Hawaii, and it's like 1,000, 2,000 miles away. So they're literally in the middle of nowhere. They didn't hear that the war was over. So after they finished uh, you know, raiding some ships down there, they sailed north. How far north? Hawaii? Uh, further than that. They went all the way to the Bering Sea. How about that? Last shots of the Civil War in the Bering Sea. Yeah, you were thinking Appomattox Courthouse was the end of it. Huh? A couple skirmishes for another month in Texas. Nope, Bering Sea. Turns out the captain, James Waddell, didn't believe the war was over, even though he was told by a couple prisoners it was over. And then he finally uh, jumped a whaling ship there in the middle of the Bering Strait, and they showed him a newspaper from April, and he looked at that and was like, oh, my God, the war's over. Yeah, so instead of, uh, you know, Instead of this being a wartime action, this could easily be construed as piracy. <laughs> but he didn't know the war was over, so he let everybody go on the boat and uh, left. So instead of turning himself in somewhere like, say, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, maybe, you know, a U.S. coast. Uh, nope, he decides to sail all the way to Great Britain, the long way. Yeah, look at the map over here. Look at this. He went the long way, all the way around Australia. There is no Suez Canal, so he had to go around Africa. Sailed into London with the Confederate flag still on his ship. Marched into the Royal Navy headquarters and handed it over. Said, uh, hey, I'm, Cap I'm Captain James Waddell with the Confederate States Navy, and uh, here's the flag, and I'm surrendering the ship. And that was on November the 6th, 1865 in London. Yeah, this is six months after the war was over, so... <laughs> Kind of strange. Didn't see that one come. What happened to James Waddell? Well, he hung around in Britain until 1870 before he went back to the States. Uh, former Confederate officers and government officials weren't supposed to have any kind of uh, you know, government office or supervisory position. So Maryland decided to put him in charge of their oyster regulation fleet. Yeah, how about that? Sounds like supervisory to me. Oyster regulation fleet? There is such a thing? Caught me off guard too, man. A lot of weird stuff going on on this planet. So strange things in the Civil War taking place in places you'd never expect to see it happen. Hey, who's this nice little guy? His name? Satakosaurus. That's what we call him. Don't worry about the P, just Satakosaurus. Nice, smiley little guy. Now, you see the things on the side of the head? They're called cheek horns. For the longest time, there was controversy whether or not they had cheek horns. And then they were thinking maybe just the males had cheek horns. Now they've conceded that everybody who was at Sacasaurus had cheekbones, I mean cheek horns. Now, why do they have these things? Is it to swing at somebody? Maybe it's possible. It's not very big. You'll see the size in a second. I think that those, uh, those cheek horns are extensions to, uh, to help anchor the jaw. Maybe not so much for Sacasaurus, but later it's descendants, you know, like Triceratops and uh, you know, people like that. So somebody, with a capital S somebody, was thinking ahead. That's what it would look like. I was wandering around outside in my backyard. Right, Satakosaurus from 126 million years ago to 101 million years ago. So 25 million years. Not a bad run. Not huge. Kind of small. Come back and check out uh, what it's going to look like in a few million years. As you can see by the graphic over there, it's known as parrot lizard. Because it looks like a parrot. You see? Look at that. Look at the mouth on this thing. So look a lot like, say, Protoceratops or Triceratops or Stracosaurus somewhere down the road. Yep. Like I said, it's the ancestor. And unlike the other ones, it's actually a, um, 
bipedal. It could, you know, crawl around on fords if it needs to, to forge stuff close to the ground, but it's what they call an obligate bipedal. It means it usually walks around on two legs. So small herbivore, plant eater, just kind of minds its own business. Mongolia, China, Siberia is kind of where you find it, though they have found fossils as far as Thailand or what's going to be Thailand one day. As you can see, just standing around, not very big. You know, compare to somebody who's six feet tall or 1.8 meters if you're over in some country that's not using the English system, which would be every country on the planet except the United States. But nonetheless, not a very big animal. It just kind of, it's not a real threat to anybody if you run into one of these things in a time portal. It just eats its plants, disappears. Mostly a desert animal, but, you know, if it's running around out in a place with high vegetation, it could probably hide there and you wouldn't even know it was there. Different angles of what it might look like. See, we got the whole controversy about the cheekbones taken care of. But now, what's that thing on the tail, man? Some kind of weird bristles. At first, it was fodder for the feathered dinosaurs with non-feathered dinosaurs taking their feathers. But they're not feathers because they're way too thin, plus only on the back of the tail. Some people thought maybe they were quills, kind of like a porcupine for defense. Swing the tail around, but they're, they're too far up. You know, wouldn't they be further back so you could really hit somebody with it? And plus, uh, they didn't seem like really rigid. So we're not really sure what it is. Uh, there was one theory that was like Dimetrodon helped warm itself up, but that's not going to fly. And why only in the back of the tail? It'd be the entire length of the back, wouldn't it? Yeah, so if anything else, Mother Nature is very practical. So we're still trying to figure out what this bristle stuff is. But, you know, some people still maintain it's like a porcupine for defense. And you'll wonder... What kind of thing would try and chase down Cetacosaurus? I mean, it's not that big, right? Well, here's something we know attacked it. We talked about this guy one time before. Yep, here we are, the Repo Man, Repinomamus. He was the killer rat. We know that you know, most mammals in the Mesozoic era, you think they're small mouse things hiding somewhere. Not this guy. He's a player out there, man. Minor league, but he's out there hunting. And uh, the killer rat here went up against at least one Cetacosaurus that we know of because we have fossils of it. There it is. Evidence of the battle. They must have gotten um, covered up in an eruption as ash, lava, something swooped over them. There's the actual uh, fossil. And right here is what they think it might have looked like. Artists. And yep, there's the bristles again. So not really sure, you know, 100% what was going on. But it certainly looks like we know a uh, Cetacosaurus is a... Uh, plant eater and the killer rat over here has teeth and it's clearly doing the attacking so never a dull moment in the mesozoic just because you're small doesn't mean you can't fight great things have small beginnings tacitus said that roman guy look him up you get bored uh, especially during the super bowl <laughs> great things have small beginnings cetacosaurus not very big you've seen how big it is and there it is the ultimate ceratops and triceratops it's going to turn into a very huge animal. It's going to have four very big feet. Got those horns sticking out. See see those uh, cheek horns? Think about those things moving a little bit. Eyes kind of in a good place. Got a frill. So it goes from a small animal that's to fight off killer rats to uh, one of the most ferocious plant eaters the world's ever seen. Something even T-Rex thinks twice about fighting. Small things, great things have small beginnings. Keep that in mind when you set up on a goal for yourself. Hey, got that Super Bowl game coming up. That used to be a small thing because nobody knew what it was. Super Bowl One wasn't even called Super Bowl One back in January 67. It was called the first World Championship game. The AFL versus the NFL. AFL, American Football League, NFL, National Football League. They merged, absorbing the AFL. The very first Super Bowl, retro named Super Bowl One, LA Coliseum. And look who's playing. The legendary Green Bay Packers against the... Kansas City Chiefs, yes, one of the teams playing this year. It's the Chiefs' first Super Bowl. They start off the Dallas Texans way back in 1960, won an AFL championship with that name. They won another AFL championship as the Kansas City Chiefs, and here they are in a Super Bowl, a game no one's really fully understanding what's going on. <laughs> Nonetheless, the Green Bay Packers win that first Super Bowl over the Kansas City Chiefs 35-10. to Hey, Kansas City's back three years later, this time in Tulane Stadium. A lot different from the L.A. Coliseum. Cold, wet, muddy, just the way I like it. Kansas City playing against the Minnesota Vikings. 
ironically, the Vikings were an AFL team in 1960. The NFL enticed them to come over in 61. So it's kind of like the first AFL team against the most recent AFL team. Anyway, look at it. The Chiefs win it 23-7, to starting a long history of Super Bowl futility for the Minnesota Vikings. Meanwhile, the Chiefs have a trophy. It took a long time before they came back, and San Francisco, a team that had been anywhere, nowhere near a championship, having started 1946, finally got their first one in Super Bowl 16 when they played in the Detroit Pontiac Silverdome, nice climate controlled in Detroit in January, and knocked off the Cincinnati Bengals 26-21. First one for San Francisco. San Fran dominates the 80s. In 1984, they're playing in Stanford Stadium. Stanford's 20 miles south of San Francisco. At that, t at that time, no team had ever played a, uh, a home Super Bowl, right? This came close. Of course, in 2020, Tampa Bay does it. 2021, L.A. does it. But, you know, in 19, what was this, January of 85, no team had done it, even though Miami was a host city. The Dolphins had never been there, and San Francisco's only playing 20 miles away, so it's basically a home game for these guys. They run right through the Dolphins, 38-16. Hey, speaking of Miami, that's the site for Super Bowl 23, and the Niners are going to get to know this stadium really well. Anyway, Super Bowl 23, the San Francisco 49ers, and look who's back. The Cincinnati Bengals got ourselves a rematch. This one came down at the end when uh, Joe Montana led a 92-yard drive in the, uh, at the end of the game to pull the Niners past Cincinnati 16-13. Uh, allegedly, that's the same jersey he was wearing in, in the other Super Bowl, which is, you know, I don't know, I guess money must have been tight back then. Also, according to legend, while uh, San Francisco coach Bill Walsh was very excited because it's 13-9 to and they're losing, and they have the ball in the eight-yard line, Joe Montana looked into the stands and saw Joe, uh, John Candy and said, look, there's John Candy, and then went out and you know led a 92-yard touchdown. Don't know if it's true, but hey, they got the win. Hey, the following year, Super Bowl 24, San Francisco 55, Denver 10. Also see Massacre. It was a complete, utter, they, they should have called this thing off in the third period where somebody got hurt, man. The Broncos got a field goal, 55 straight unanswered San Francisco points. All touchdowns, they missed an extra point. Denver gets a touchdown at the end, it doesn't make a difference. Fourth Super Bowl there for San Francisco, right there in the clean, uh, clean confines of the New Orleans Superdome. Hey, a few years later, Super Bowl 29, I guess who's back for number five? It's San Francisco, and it's in Miami again, second time in that stadium. And yes, they're wearing throwback jerseys. I guess they got suspicious, I mean, I guess superstitious. They had a really good string of luck with those jerseys. They went up against the San Diego Chargers and totally destroyed them 49-26. to 26. That's their second entry for Massacre, in case you missed the first one. Um, this was always a, this was a heartbreaker for me because the Steelers had lost to the Chargers, uh, two weeks earlier when we had them on the ropes and then we drove all the way to the three yard line and had the ball knocked down on a fourth and three. Yeah. Don't forget that one. Well, maybe just as well. Look how San Francisco just bombed San Diego. So maybe it's a good thing we lost that game, which nobody except me remembers. 49ers, man, they're still there heading off to Super Bowls. It was a while, but they got back to one Super Bowl 47. Back in New Orleans, they won there one time before. This is the one where the lights went out. Yep, lights went out in half the uh, New Orleans Superdome. They had to stop the game for, I don't know, like 45 minutes, and it actually allowed uh, people to warm up, and it kind of broke the Ravens' momentum, and the 49ers fought their way back in. But Baltimore won at 34-31. They said it was too dark to play. I'll be honest with you, man. I think they could have kept playing that game. Don't look too dark. Don't look too dark to you? I don't know. Anything to extend the game, get more commercials, you know? That's what that was all about. Oh, look who's back for the first time since the Nixon administration. The Kansas City Chiefs, Super Bowl 54. Hey, that's in Miami. Third time for the 49ers in that stadium. These are my two favorite pictures. This one, you see... Uh, you see how uh, Mahomes can run around out on open field back then. It looks like he's getting kind of getting old and slowing down a little bit. And I love this picture because this 49er sitting on his face. <laughs> That's just funny. And I like this guy too. Just, uh, hey, I'm just watching this stuff. How about that? I get paid to watch this. What a great job. 
Super Bowl 55. Hey, it's in Tampa Bay, and there's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. First time a team had hosted their own Super Bowl. And, uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but I see some holding right here, huh? That's definitely holding. Where are you on this one, ref? Well, it wouldn't matter if you called it. Tom Brady's still going to win it. Tampa Bay dethrones Kansas City 31-9. A couple years later, look what we got. We got Kansas City again going up against Philadelphia out in the desert. Not really the desert. It's in a very, very nice stadium called State Farm Stadium in Tempe, Arizona. I mean, I'm sorry, Glendale, Arizona. And, um, yep, Chiefs are going to win this one 38-35. Pretty good one. Philly had a chance, man. I don't know. But Philly has bad luck in that stadium. For some reason, they always lose to the Cardinals. They lost a, lost a conference championship game there back there in 2008, which meant they would have played the Steelers had they won. Some, thing, some stadiums just have a grip on some teams. You know what I mean? Apparently, it doesn't bother Kansas City too much. So they won that one last year. This year, Chiefs are back again, man. Do we have a dynasty growing? Don't know. San Francisco's there to do battle with them. It's a rematch of that one a few years back. They're having it in Las Vegas over there, Allegiant Stadium. They call it the Death Star. San Francisco's actually favored, which is kind of strange considering Kansas City's record of recent glory here. On the other hand, I would really like to see San Francisco win, not because I want them to tie the Steelers' record of six Super Bowls. I just want to see Taylor Swift crying. That's all I want to see. <laughs> all righty. Well, you guys have yourself a fantastic weekend. Do what you do best. Go out there. Have fun. Keep it safe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Touch that little bell down there so you know when I've thrown something up there for you to take a look at. Uh, correct my many, many mistakes down in the comments. And you guys have yourself a fantastic day. And I will see you next week. Das Vidanya.